What's up, heathens? How y'all doing? I'm the godless engineer, and uh, I critically analyze apologist claims to give you the best arguments and information so that you can stand up and use your voice. Tonight, we are going to be discussing the topic of mythicism that came up on uh, Cameron Bertuzzi's live stream while he was interviewing Dr. Jeremiah Johnston. I know that it's Dr. Jeremiah Johnson, but he most definitely graduated, graduated with a PhD in New Testament studies from a religious uh, portion of, of a larger secular school. Uh, we'll get to that. That's actually a pretty big topic in Cameron's uh, section tonight. Uh, but we are going to be going over the blunders of Cameron Bertuzzi on the topic of mythicism uh, and uh, having like a live example of why you can't trust New Testament academics or, bib or biblical scholarship, really. Uh, we're going to be throwing up a whole bunch of like quotes and shit you know, like fucking evidence. And so we're going to be doing a lot of that tonight. If you want to fuck around and find out how wrong Cameron Bertuzzi is about the state or the position of mythicism, then please stay tuned. So, uh, Cameron here had Jeremiah on so that they could discuss his new book. They wanted to hawk his apologetic book that uh, is, is uh, in my opinion, it's quite bad. I haven't read all of it, but I have read some of it. It's a pop level book meant for people, for lay people, right? So don't expect too many um, citations or footnotes. In fact, uh, I mean, there, there are a good number of footnotes. I will say one of the footnotes is just a tweet from somebody on Twitter. <laughs> I, I, I'm assuming that the person said something that was necessary for his book. But anyways, so uh, Jeremiah Johnston has stu studied under Dr. Craig Evans, who we've covered here before uh, on this channel. Uh, he's also got several degrees from like theological, uh, theological seminaries and also uh, very religiously oriented organizations. He currently works for a Baptist organization. You know, he's written a book called The Body of Proof, which we will I, I will discuss a little bit uh, in case you're curious about how bad it is. Uh, I do have the section, the small, the smallest section on mythicism where he covers mythicism. We're actually going to read through that and we're going to look at what he thinks uh, about mythicism, which is not much. Yeah, uh, he, he definitely doesn't interact with, with any of the mythicist material. He just sort of holds arguments out of his ass. Uh, uh, you know, maybe some common arguments that he sees like on Twitter, because apparently that's where he lives at. All right. So now Cameron's going to, going to lean in with the question and, uh, you know, I'll give my thoughts. So anyways, let's move on to uh, just a couple more questions. and I think we'll, we'll close it out. So uh, someone did just ask, actually, uh, it be me is their name. Has Dr. Johnston responded at all to any of the myth, uh, mythicist objections? Uh, no, uh, I'll just say this right now. Uh, he does not respond to any mythicist objections to uh, any of his stuff, which I do want to preface all of this to say that I would not use the mythicist position to argue against the resurrection. Granted, a lot of the evidence that is contained in mythicism is also applicable to the resurrection question, but I would not use it as an argument to say like, oh, Jesus didn't exist, therefore he couldn't resurrect. Because what the actual minimal mythicist position is, is that Jesus existed as this celestial divine being as far as Paul understands Jesus and Paul being representative of early Jewish Christians, how they would have understood Jesus as this celestial divine being who died in the heavens, uh, crucified by uh, Satan and his demons to which he then resurrected in the lower heavens and then uh, went back up to the upper heavens. So, I mean, even on the minimal mythicist hypothesis, there is still a resurrection going on there because the earliest uh, Jewish Christians still believed in a resurrection. It's just how did that resurrection happen? Like, where did it happen? It happening in the celestial realm, which was a physical place. That's uh, that that seems more in line with the uh, uh, Jewish ideas at the time. We'll get to, to more information about that here in a minute. Believe it or not, yes. mythicism is alive and well on YouTube. 
Well, maybe that's not it, too difficult do you, to believe. Cameron, I want to I want to ask you a question. Uh, another thing to point out here is that mythicism is not just alive and well on YouTube. I mean, it is. There are plenty of people talking about it. There is a discussion being going on uh, uh, around this topic, and more people are starting to actually address the topic, albeit dis dishonestly uh, interacting with it. Is is my summation? Like everything that I've seen is a dishonest attempt to uh, either represent myth mythicism like as far as them talking about mythicism or um they are are fallaciously attacking mythicism uh for things that it doesn't say. And so um, it is on YouTube, but it's also very much alive and well in the academic community. Currently, there are 37 scholars that uh, are either doubtful of Jesus's existence as a historical person, or they're at least sympathetic to the minimal mythicist uh, position. With 37 scholars that are uh, that, that are in that category, plus there being two peer-reviewed monographs uh, about uh, the topic, uh, both peer-reviewed, uh, just like other uh, other like textbooks and everything like that that's been published, uh, other journal articles, um, it's been put the, through the ringer, other academics have looked over the argument and they haven't found a problem with the argument. Whether or not they agree with the argument doesn't matter. The fact is, is that they couldn't find a problem problem with the argument. And it's about to be put through the ringer one more time when Dr. Carrier uh, uh, does his second revised edition or his second edition that will include new information. It'll have to go back through that peer review process. So the argument has been peer reviewed multiple times. Um, it, it's just that uh, the Christian apologists, like both of these guys, uh, they don't want to admit that in, in academic circles, it is in fact being questioned. And I would say that it's very telling that the uh, historicist side have not put up a similar type of defense of historicity. Dr. Uh, Bart Ehrman, he uh, published his Did Jesus Exist book in 2012, which was about two years before On the History of Jesus got published. Another thing is that Did Jesus Exist by Bart Ehrman is not peer reviewed. It's a popular le level book. So no other academics had to like give their input on it or tell Bart that he needed to rework stuff or uh, catch any errors that he might have had, which he's got plenty of. The one thing that I don't understand about Christian apologists like Cameron Bertuzzi in this particular situation is that the number of scholars that are either sympathetic or adopt the mythicist position has only grown since 2014. Like it, the, the, the number of scholars keeps piling up We're we're not losing the number of scholars. We're only adding to it, it seems. And so uh, I think the reason why is because a good bulk of the mythicist, uh, minimal mythicist position is mainstream scholarship. It's, it's pretty much all mainstream scholarship up until a certain point. And it's just that uh, on the history of Jesus, as well as Raphael Tasser's questioning the history of Jesus, they're, they're the books. They're, they're they're the guys that are putting the puzzle pieces together from these uh, different portions of the mainstream consensus to show like, oh, hey, look, it seems more likely that he probably didn't exist or we can never know that he ever existed. It's weird how they're framing it as a, an online phenomenon. Every single apologist that I've heard frames it this way, that it's this online phenomenon. It's not. Scholars are either sympathetic or they adopt the minimal mythicist position. Let me be the host of Capturing Christianity for a minute. I've always wanted okay. to take this channel over. Why do you think as a YouTuber that mythicism is still so popular and, and as a result, subsequently so influential, especially on like Gen Z, for example? Um, I, I, I think it might be, that's a good question. I'd have to, I'd have to think uh, probably a lot more about it to come to some like kind of um, definitive conclusion, but... So he's going to eventually get there and he's going to continue to talk about it. But what Cameron eventually uh, says is rather dumb. What, what I think is happening here is that as people are exposed to the actual mythicist hypothesis, instead of the uh, pre-2014 uh, non-academic mythicist community, um, 
I, I, I feel like being exposed to the more academic uh, version of the argument, people are, are becoming convinced because it's the least ad hoc explanation. There's very little uh, uh, assumptions that are built into it. And and the su- assumptions that are there, I, I can't think of one right now that is just like a baseless assumption because Dr. Carrier in, in his book, he argues from evidence. He doesn't argue from evidence that we don't have or anything like that. And that's the reason why I, I really focus on on Carrier's version of the mythicist uh, argument is because he's based on evidence. He has evidence for every conclusion that he comes to and every conclusion that he comes to, whether it's due to direct evidence or inferred information, he has good reasons to come to it. Uh, when we think about the vast landscape of Jewish ideology in the first century and, and how the Jews were thinking about their faith, it seems likely that uh, a, a um, myth about Jesus would have eventually started even if there was no person around to like model off of it because the entire model for Jesus or the Messiah rather is already in the Old Testament. They just use the Old Testament to create the New Testament and this new gospel of Jesus. That That's all they did. Here, here's what I would like. It would be awesome if I could talk to Cameron about mythicism and and answer his questions about it because i get that a, an 800 page book uh, jesus from outer space is a lot shorter than that uh it, it's a, a bit more accessible but i get it people don't don't want to want to read things that they disagree with i have a huge problem with reading the body of body of proof or the case for christ or anything like that mainly because i hear a bunch of dumb shit said in quick succession and i get a headache and so i gotta stop but uh on the history of Jesus is such a verbose book. I get it that people don't want to spend the time to read it. That's why I try to make myself available and and try to put out information about it, giving you good information about the hypothesis. It's crazy to me that none of these people will even do the most basic of research on the topic, like at all. Even on the history of Jesus is only $35 on fucking Amazon. It's not that expensive. The Taster's book is, is... priced outside of the realm of like accessibility really for a lot of people uh, because it's a it's an actual college textbook so if you think in terms of college textbooks it's like a hundred two hundred dollars but it was published by brill you know so there's that I, I think what it might be coupled with is the sort of um i'm trying to think of the right term for it but a, a, a distrust of authorities especially when you think that authority is biased towards some conclusion. So you're just going to disbelieve that person and then go and, and find some other authority that you sort of agree with already and then uh, use that person. So I, I, I'm noticing like even with um, with my work, my own work, I, I'm trying to always point people in the direction because I'm a layman. I'm always trying to point them in the direction of the experts. Like follow this guy, listen to what this guy has to say, listen to this expert. And instead of listening to, to what me, a, a, a YouTuber, a photographer, a layman, like don't listen to what I have to say. Cause e- even when I put out my own videos, I always have them, um, uh, vetted by philosophers. Like I'll have a, a philosopher read the, the script and provide comments and feedback and point out different bad arguments that I'm making and stuff. I don't know what philosophers he's fucking bugging about his content, but if it's representative, if his Twitter or his, his YouTube community page posts are reflective of any of that, he needs to talk to different philosophers because he puts up these dumbass syllogisms all the time. And they obviously don't make sense. Like they've got flawed premises and all this other kind of stuff. Now he could be doing that just to just to gain traction on, on the social media algorithms and get people talking about it because you get a whole bunch of atheists that are like, point number four is dumb as fuck. Why would you have that up there? That, uh, obviously that's gonna, that's gonna get you around social media because people are gonna engage with it. So maybe he's doing that because because he knows that people will like have a problem with his dumbass syllogism. From what I can tell of his of his content that he's got on capturing Christianity, it's pretty much just basic apologetics. Like it really is. Uh, low bar bill. He uses low bar bill logic a lot. He doesn't ever really present like deep philosophical arguments like he thinks he does. But I mean, that's just my opinion. I, I don't think that Cameron has, has good content as far as the philosophical side of it goes. I'm sure he feels the exact same way about mine. We're, we're on even ground there. 
But he's sitting there saying that like the reason why people are starting to accept mythicism more often is because we, we have a bias against Christian scholars. And he elaborates a little bit more on this here coming up here in a minute. But notice how he's really putting a focus on the authorities or people that he considers the authorities. He, he says that don't trust me, go and listen to the authorities, which I mean, I can agree with go listen to the experts. But when I write my mythicism videos, I do citations, I provide citations. And if I don't have citations in the description, I can definitely give you citations for the things that I talk about. I also work off of an argument from evidence. I will provide you with the evidence that has been argued by the experts. And usually I also cite where the experts say this shit. So I, I guess I'm in the same boat as Cameron with the exception that I'm not sitting there integrating myself and saying like, oh, I'm just some lowly fuck. Don't listen to me. I'm saying, look, I've read the scholarly information. This is what it says. And this is what makes sense. Here's a citation so that you can read it for yourself. It's really kind of bothersome that Cameron portrays it as people are just biased against Christian scholars, because if it were just simply that on its face, I could see how that might look like a problem, but that's not what the issue is. I distrust Christian scholars because as, as we'll see here in a minute, there's a good reason to distrust Christian scholars, like biblical scholars, New Testament scholars and all that. I'm not saying that everything that they write or every conclusion they come to is tainted because they are Christian. I'm saying that they are Christian and therefore their conclusions can be tainted by that dogmatic faith. And it's very obvious as we'll see with Dr. Jeremiah Johnston here. He's terrible at this. He's a good he, he is a good example of the exact problem with New Testament studies. And we'll, we'll get to that here in a minute. So I, I'm always trying to submit to these authorities that are actual like experts on, on the subject matter. But um, I, I suppose if I were to guess like what is behind it, it, it might be a sort of distrust in general of religious authorities or, or, or people who are, say, Christian scholars or Christian New Testament scholars or even Christian philosophers. They think that they're uh, sort of jaded or biased. And so we can't trust them. And so they'll turn to, uh, to other people that they think are not as biased. And, um, maybe they'll find someone like Richard Carrier. So okay. So here's the first quote that I want to bring up. Okay. And I mean, I worked hard this afternoon in order to get all these quotes, uh, because this is not just a mythicist position, like the bias in biblical studies. This is something that's actually been studied like a good bit. Uh, so this is Hector Avalos. Hector Avalos uh, recently passed away. His opinions are still very important. So this is uh, Hector Avalos from the end of biblical studies. Uh, I got the Kindle locations there because that's what I got. Um, Hector says, most biblical scholars in academia are still ministers or believers with specific denominational, denominational affiliations. Most religious studies programs in public institutions espouse a liberal or plur pluralistic approach to religion religion that frowns on criticism of religion as a whole. Even more resisted is the criticism of specific religious traditions. Hector wrote that in 2007, and there have been other analyses of biblical studies that have shown that there is an inherent problem in the, the academic community, in this particular academic community. So I, I get that Cameron wants to portray it as if there's this unnecessary bias against Christian scholars because they're Christian. But that's not the problem. The problem is, is that the academic community that's primarily composed of Christians seems to just only be doing apologetics because they're mostly ministers and theologians. They're not historians. They always claim to be. This was the video, honey, that I was watching when I was in the car, I think uh, earlier this morning. And I was like, you're not a fucking historian. Because Jeremiah Johnson, Johnston, he claims to be a historian when he's a New Testament scholar. Now, I'm not saying that Jeremiah Johnston doesn't have the necessary like 
training in order to discuss like the history of Jesus or the historical Jesus. I'm saying as far as historical Jesus studies go, historical Jesus studies is primarily comprised of textual critics, biblical scholars, and New Testament stu uh, New Testament scholars, right? Not historians. So it's really just a little bit of nuance here because saying, oh, I am a historian gives you a little bit different of a credibility than, oh, I'm a New Testament scholar. A New Testament scholar is an educated apologist. Uh, reason why I don't think that this, uh, I'm a little bit hesitant to put this hypothesis out there is because I can't understand how someone could think that a Christian scholar is biased, but then read Richard Carrier and think that he's not biased. Oh, I'm so glad you brought up this fucking topic, Cameron. Either outcome would satisfy me. This is Carrier talking about either historicity or a historicity. For my biases are such as to make no difference what the result should be. I only want the truth to be settled. Nevertheless, all historians have biases, biases, whatever. And only sound methods will prevent those from too greatly affecting our essential results. No progress in historical knowledge, in fact, no historical knowledge at all, would be possible without such methods. Richard Carrier on the history of, on the history of Jesus, pages 9 and 10, the very beginning of the book, Carrier admits, yes, all historians have biases, but... It's through the method that we use can we remove as much of that bias as possible. And Dr. Carrier in his book, and there, I'm mentioning Dr. Carrier so much because he's got the minimal mythicist position. He's the one that puts, for, puts it forward and he's the one that wrote about it. Um, so I'm going directly back to the, 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 the source of, of my position. Dr. Carrier, throughout his book, he argues for two possibilities he argues a fortiori, which means uh, from the strongest position possible is, is what that indicates. So from the strongest position possible, what's the most charitable we can be about the, the evidence for Jesus? And so he analyzes the evidence based on that and he comes to a conclusion. And the a fortiori conclusion is uh, he, he gives a specific number, 33%, but basically it's unlikely that Jesus existed in history, right? Um, not incredibly unlikely. There's still a possibility for Jesus to have existed. He even admits that. Of course, his lower conclusion is is much more in aligned with what, what his opinion is about the evidence. Uh, so... Um, the, the the one is is going against his opinion and uh say, and giving Christians some ground on some evidence. Like I can give you a really good example of this. So for um, Romans one three being evidence for a historical Jesus, Doctor Carrier's minimal mythicism actually counts in favor of historicity. He says that it's twice as likely that that verse would exist in the way that it does on historicity as a historicity. Of course, he makes a cogent argument for why a historicity actually does make more sense. But as far as arguing a fortiori goes, he argues that it's twice as likely. So Cameron asks the question, how do we read Richard Carrier and not see biases there too? Well, he admits that there are biases, but we can see through his methodology that he tries to weed those biases out by having an a fortiori position that is his conclusion that he puts forth. Uh, but he also has something that's more along the lines of what his opinion about the evidence is. There's no way he's read OHD, not even a little fucking bit. Or even, uh, like, even if he read it, I doubt that he would actually be able able to understood the argument that's being put forth because I feel like, and this is just my opinion. I feel like Cameron is very clouded with his, with his faith. But uh, Casey said that if Cameron has to consult philosophers for his dumbass tweets, then he will never understand OHJ. So we've established that Richard Carrier, uh, uh, well, the minimal position rather admits that there's biases and uh, accounts for those biases by uh, providing two different conclusions an a fortiori, which seems to argue in favor of historicity, meaning that at every turn that they can, that, that we can reliably and, and uh, I guess rationally somewhat give evidence to the historicity side, we do it. And Jesus still comes up with a one third probability of existing or just slightly likely that he existed. So, exactly. um, 
Yeah. Well, but I mean, <laughs> yeah. It, it, and I would just add this too. Don't you also wonder, Cameron? I mean, it's alarming to me how few books people actually read, how people are reading fewer and fewer books. Mm. So people are just more moronic when it comes to history. They don't know history. They don't know when World War I was, when World War II was. They don't understand the thought patterns that influence governments and universities. And so, you know, when you tell them something like Arian and Plutarch are the only two sources we have for Alexander the Great, and they write 400 years after Alexander the Great. Now, I got I to gotta stop him right there. Got to stop you for a minute there, JJ, okay? Because, listen, you're providing a great example of two things. One's irony, because he's sitting there complaining about people not reading books, about not being informed on how history is done, when he's only been tangentially exposed to how to do history, because New Testament scholarship is tangential to history, but it's not history. It's about how to defend the faith. That's what New Testament scholarship is. But, uh, so that's one, irony, the fact that he's complaining about people being moronic, but, uh, and, and not reading books and all this other stuff, uh, and not knowing how to do history when he himself doesn't know how to do history. But he's also a great example of how untrustworthy New Testament scholars are. Because what he said right there about Alexander the Great is wrong. And you know what? If he would have actually consulted any kind of uh, either mythicist work like Richard Carrier's book or quite literally any other applicable historical uh, analysis of Alexander the Great, you would know that he's wrong and he wouldn't say this kind of dumb ass shit. And if you're like, oh, GE, but we need the evidence. You got that shirt that says got evidence. Well, where's your fucking evidence there, godless engineer? Well, I do got some evidence that you can fact check me on. Of course, coming from on the history of Jesus, primarily I use this book uh, because of the fact that if they would have just read it, they would know this kind of shit. But Carrier does address this. A greater gaffe in defense of Jesus' historicity is to make claims that are conspicuously opposite the truth of the matter. As when E.P. Sanders boasts that the sources for Jesus are better than those that deal with Alexander the Great. A more suicidal remark for his case could hardly be imagined. Unlike Jesus, we have over half a dozen relatively objective historians discussing the history of Alexander the Great. Most notably, Diodorus, Dionys uh, Dionysius, Rufus, Trogus, Plutarch, and more. That's uh, Richard Carrier on the History of Jesus, page 43. Page 43! It's on page 90 of Jesus from Outer Space if you don't want a big fucking book with all the information in it. But Jesus from Outer Space is, is, is really good too. Uh, it's got, you know, the same information. It's just a pop level version of on the history of Jesus. Jeremiah Johnston here just... He either is incompetent as far as uh, his history goes, or he's lying to his audience about how many people we have referencing Alexander the Great. Now, what he talked about for Alexander the Great is true. We've got Arian who wrote four, four to five hundred years after Alexander died. But the important point with Alexander the Great is that uh, Arian, who has the best biography, as far as we could tell, about Alexander the Great, he used two first-hand eyewitness accounts of Alexander the Great to inform his biography. And how do we know this? Because he has an extensive section talking about his sources, why they were good sources, and even naming the, his sources. And uh, Plutarch would have done the exact same thing too, because Plutarch was an actual histo ancient historian. So he would have had a section discussing his sources. He would have had a section uh, uh, discussing why those sources are the best sources to use and all this other stuff. But Arian and Plutarch are are two sources, but we have more than that. It's just that Arian is the best biography that we have of Alexander the Great. That's it. So Jeremiah Johnston is, is a prime example of why you should not trust what New Testament scholars say. Now that doesn't mean, I don't mean for that to come across as they're all lying to you or everything they say is false. That's not what that means. What that means is that you've got to be super critical of these scholars. You got to be super critical of somebody like Dr. Jeremiah Johnston here. I, like I said, he's either incompetent or he's lying because he would have like it, in this particular area, if he was an expert in this area, he would have understood the sources we have for Alexander the Great and, 
or or if he uh, if he didn't know about that, he should know how to research that to better inform himself. We could be very charitable here and we could say, well, Jeremiah Johnstone just pulled two names out of his ass because those are the two names that he knows. But if you're going to be speaking about this, he wrote a section. We're going to cover his section in his book, but he wrote about this in his book about mythicism. You would think that you would do a little bit of research on the topic like he he values the whole scholarly community, right? He, t- he talks all throughout this interview about the scholarly community. What do scholars say about this? What do scholars say about that? But yet when it comes to the opposition in this manner, he does not consult scholars. Why is that? Why won't they consult the scholars? On it, like uh, Raphael the Taster is questioning the historicity of Jesus, or uh, Doctor either of Doctor Carrier's book Jesus from Outer Space, or on the historicity of Jesus. Hell, you could even go to Proving History by Richard Carrier because he covers the methodology that he uses in order to tackle the question of the historicity of Jesus. He could do that, or he could just remain in incompetence. So. Again, being very charitable, he just doesn't know about it, but he should. And so that's that's a nick against him. So the other two options are incompetence or lying. I, I sway away from lying. I don't like to say that people are liars. Um, it takes a very special occasion for that to happen. It's either incompetence or lying. It's one of the two. I'm I'm betting on incompetence, though. Uh, what we have with Jesus, Bart Ehrman, uh, he calls them, what does he call them? And Bart Ehrman calls the mythicist howlers. That's what he calls them in his book. <laughs> Sorry to stop it so quick. Bart Ehrman does not call mythicists howlers in, in Did Jesus Exist, which is what he's about to reference here. Um, uh, I, I mean, I could I could bring it up, but uh, it, the, the howlers is only mentioned once in the book. And uh, Bart Ehrman was actually talking about uh, arguments. Or, or statements or claims that Archaia S was making are howlers, not that Archaia S is a howler or whatever in the fuck that would mean. The arguments are howlers because it makes you like laugh at, at the mere proposition of it. Uh, you know, the, the way that I get when somebody tells me that Matthew wrote the gospel of Matthew or Mark wrote the gospel of Mark, I just go, ah, <laughs> That's fucking dumb. It's that kind of thing. And even in that section, uh, Bart Ehrman gets shit wrong about Archaia S's own arguments. Like it, the arguments aren't correct the way that Archaia S has them, but it's even uh, 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 even more wrong when um, when Bart Ehrman tries to correct a few of them. Just just going to show that Bart Ehrman himself is also not up to date on any of these topics either. I mean for that to sound like I was defending Archaia S there. I'm definitely not an Archaia S type of mythicist. Like I said at the beginning of this, I argue from the evidence. Uh, if there's if there's evidence of it, then I'm more likely to believe it. But if we don't have evidence of it, or at least a solid argument that utilizes evidence to come to the conclusion, then uh, I'm probably not going to believe it. Uh, it takes 20 pages and rips them apart. And did Jesus really exist in his book? And he calls them howlers. It's so funny. He even gets the fucking title wrong. Like, how, how do you get the, it's just the title. It's did Jesus exist? Hold on, let me, let me double check to make sure, uh, because he, he makes another blunt. Did Jesus exist? The historical argument for the Jesus of Nazareth. Yeah. It's not, did Jesus really exist? It's just, did Jesus exist? I mean, I know I get it. That That's kind of a small nitpicky thing, but I feel like it just is another piece of evidence that he doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about. <laughs> They're just laughable. I mean, you you can't, if you don't believe in Jesus of history, don't believe in the Roman Empire. He says this as if Dr. Ehrman says this in his book. That's not a direct quote. I couldn't find uh, anything concerning the Roman Empire uh, or like, uh, the historicity of Jesus uh, in Did Jesus Exist that would match this quote. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, Bart hasn't said that somewhere else. It sounds like something that Bart would say because Bart is very sure that Jesus existed in history. The point that I want to make is that uh, Bart did not uh, say that in his book, Did Jesus Exist? But he may still hold that opinion. But in either case, it's a dumb fucking thing to say. And it's a dumb fucking thing to say because of the very uh, scant evidence we have for Jesus. It's very poor evidence and compared to other historical figures, it's it's really weak. I, I don't know what he's talking about when he says that 
like, you know, you should, uh, if you don't believe in, in the historical Jesus, then you shouldn't believe in the Roman Empire. We have physical fucking evidence for the Roman Empire. Hey, heathens. Thank you so much for joining me for part one of this response video to the mythicism section that Cameron brought up to Jeremiah Johnston. It was quite a long live stream, so I'm going to be breaking this down topically. And so the next installment of this particular response will be over the evidence that Jeremiah Johnston brings up as supporting the historicity of Jesus. And of course, with Jeremiah not really reading any of the mythicist material, uh, it's going to be probably, <laughs> well, I know, the same old shit that we've heard time and time again. It's going to be playing off of something that we built here in part one, and that's the problem with New Testament studies. If you will, please go down below and let me know what you thought about uh, this response to Jeremiah Johnston and Cameron Bertuzzi. Do you think that they had good points is there anything that i should reconsider let me know down below in the comments while you're down there why don't you smash that like button and subscribe if you want to see part two of this response and forget to stand up and use your voice bye heathens